Welcome to River's Edge Community Church. Thanks so much for joining us for our worship service. We seem to be heavy on the right, a little weak on the left, but that's okay. It's just the way it works out, and I will adjust. Today we continue in our series, Paul and the Revolution of Grace. And today we want to talk about how the revolution of grace brings new life. And we celebrate that new life today by sharing the Lord's Supper together. And that makes today rather special. After all, it's June. We're talking about grace. It's communion. It's new life. All very special things. Martin Luther said it this way, and I love this. Either sin is with you, lying on your shoulders, or it is lying on Christ, the Lamb of God. Now, if it is lying on your back, you are lost. But if it is resting on Christ, you are free and you will be saved. Now, choose what you want. What a great way to open up our service. We're so glad you are here. This we believe. We believe that God is a God of unending grace who came to earth to redeem us when we were lost in sin. For we were dead in our transgressions and sins without hope and without God in the world. But Jesus left the glories of heaven and made of himself nothing. He took on our flesh and lived among us and he showed us God's face and he showed us that he was the way, the truth, and the life. Then Jesus voluntarily went to the cross and died for us and he died with us and he died instead of us. For although he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor so that through his poverty, we might become rich. This is the grace of God. This is God's amazing gift. And we believe that on the third day, Jesus rose again from the dead, revealing to all that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. And in his ascension, he declared that one day, all things will be put to rights. And now Jesus invites all of us saying, come, follow me. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is grace. This is God's amazing gift. Chris, come pray for us, please. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, you are a God of unending grace. We all come to your presence to worship you, to praise you, and to give thanks to you. For you are our Lord, and we have no good apart from you. As King David said, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. I have said the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. As Apostle Paul said, as Christ lives in me, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. Lord, as for us, you make known to us the path of life, the path of a new creation in your spirit, the path in your presence, full of grace and honor, and the path that brings us unthinkable, everlasting joy, Lord. Lord, we have no reason not giving praises and honor to you. It's our privilege to give thanks to Jesus Christ, our Savior for he has given us eternal life, Lord. We are here. We are yours. Lord, we want to thank you. We want to thank you at any moment, at any place, in every part of our life. Lord, thank you for even listening to our prayer, the cries from our heart. For this we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior. Amen. Thank you.
What a great combination, thinking about the cross and grace. They go together so well. Stand as we sing together as you're able. seated. As is our custom on days when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we like to pray through the Lord's Prayer. And today's version of that is from Scott McKnight in the book, The Jesus Creed. Let's pray this together and then I'll pause and allow you to pray for the concerns of your own heart, either out loud or silently. And then after a few moments, I will close our time together with a brief pastoral prayer. Let us remember to be praying for the situation in Ukraine. Uh, CNN is reporting today that like 113 churches have been destroyed by the Russians. It, it, I don't know exactly what all that means, if it's just accidental or targeting, but it's just a horrific situation in any regard. Let us be praying for the church there, for my friends and for many of the people that I met and just for other brothers and sisters in Ukraine. And let's be praying for our own country because it also is a mess. And we don't have to think very long before we can just start naming off names of mass shootings and terrible situations. 
let us give these things to God because he is our only hope, our only salvation. Let's pray. Father God, we are gathered here in your name. Come, meet with us. Hear the cries of our heart. Respond to our prayers. May we truly follow you in all things. May we be your people, guided by your Holy Spirit. Hear us now as we pray, saying, because we love God, we say, Because loving God means that we yearn for God to make his glory known, we say. Because loving God means we love others as God loves others. We long for all to have the necessities of life, and we say. Because we love others, we seek to unleash God's grace of forgiveness and say. Because we love others, we long that they may love and live God's will. So we say. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Because we love God and because we love others, we lift our hearts to God and say. Together, we say this today because we love God and love others. The Rogans are sick today, so John and Megan have stepped in to do their job, and Joe's going to read instead of Allison. Our scripture reading today comes from Galatians 2, verses 19 through 21. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. This is God's word for us today. And now we invite you to stand and we'll continue with our singing. At this time, we'll take up an offering. I want to remind you that the offering that we take contributes to this work both here and around the world as we support our missionaries. As you know, we had to lower our um, giving to missionaries this year, and so it's very important that we continue to support them in whatever ways we can. So I encourage you to give and to give joyfully, for God has blessed us 
with so much. At this time, let us dismiss the kids to go to their classes downstairs, and let's send them off with the blessing. Say it with me. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards us and give us peace. Kids, you are dismissed. What makes Apple TV's Ted Lasso one of the best shows ever is not that it's funny, but it definitely is. And not because it's deeply relational, which it definitely is. And not because it is about coaching soccer, which it is. But because it offers a great philosophy of life. In short, Ted has a philosophy to which we are all 
drawn. Here's a snippet of what I mean. When asked if Ted believes in ghosts, he replies, I do. But more importantly, I think they need to believe in themselves. That sums up so much of Ted's philosophy and charm. Here's Ted on self-criticism. You beating yourself up is like Woody Allen playing the clarinet. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> Ted on winning. Our goal is to go out like Willie Nelson on a high. Ted on keeping calm. There are two buttons I never like to hit, and that's panic and snooze. Ted on counseling. I love meeting people's moms. It's like reading an instruction manual on why they're nuts. <laughs> Ted on mistakes. You know what the happiest animal on earth is? It's a goldfish. You know why? It's got a 10 second memory. Be a goldfish. Ted on unity in the locker room. You two knuckleheads have split our locker room in half. And when it comes to locker rooms, I like them just like my mother's bathing suits. I only want to see them in one piece. <laughs> and Ted on obstacles. You say impossible, but all I hear is I'm possible. But one of the best summaries of Ted's philosophy comes when he's playing darts with Rupert. And Ted says, guys have underestimated my, me my entire life. And for years, I never understood why. I used to it used to really bother me. But then one day, I was driving my little boy to school, and I saw this quote by Walt Whitman. And it was painted on the wall there. It said, be curious, not judgmental. I like that. You know what? I like that too. Plus, I love hearing someone's philosophy of life. Paul has a great philosophy of life. It can be summed up in three verses at the end of Galatians chapter 2. There Paul says, For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be attained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Now, that may not be as witty as Matt Haig's one-liner, never underestimate the big importance of small things. Or as touching as Roy Bennett's advice, you were born to stand out, Stop trying to fit in. Or as fun as Mac Cooper's when he said, life has no remote. Get up and change it yourself. But it contains six life-changing truths that we all ought to embrace. It talks about basking in God's love. It talks about being rooted in Christ. It talks about trusting in God's goodness and faithfulness and promises. It talks about living in grace. It talks about being in community together. And it talks about seeing our value, not in our accomplishments, but in God's love and new creation. But Paul's philosophy wasn't shaped in a vacuum. It was shaped in a conflict that took place in the city of Antioch. Now, I'm sure you know this, but Antioch is just across the bay from where I used to live when we used to live in Turkey. But they changed the name recently from Turkey to Turkia. So wherever it was, we used to live there. You just find Adana where we used to live and go south, there's Antioch. Or you can go from Jerusalem, go up about 300 miles, and there the city is. Now Antioch was quite the cosmopolitan city back in the first century. It was a leading center of commerce and boasted of its political power. It was also a large city that featured a substantial Jewish population, which made it a perfect place for the church to use as a home base for its missionary endeavors. Hence the reason Paul and Barnabas spent a lot of time there. Fun trivia, it was in Antioch, according to Acts 11.26, that the disciples were first called Christians. That's where the word comes from. 
Now, early on, things were great in Antioch. Believers, both Jews and Gentiles, worshiped together, prayed together, served together, and ate together. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but for Jews in the first century, that was huge. See, who you ate with said something about you. It spoke about your morals. And it spoke about how you perceived the other person. It said you were equals and almost family. And it spoke about your relationship with God. It spoke about how serious you were about your faith. So it was a really big deal that Jewish believers were sharing the same table with Gentile believers. But then one day, Peter came to town. We don't know why he came, but he came. Meanwhile, Paul left the city. We don't know why he left, but he left. But even without Paul there, and I can only imagine that Paul was the life of the city, even without Paul there, Peter had a great time in Antioch. He even enjoyed the international cuisine and did so while having table fellowship with Antioch's Gentile believers. But in the midst of Peter's holiday, guests arrived from Jerusalem. And while they were Christ followers, they believed to be a true follower of Jesus. You needed to keep the law and all of its boundary markers, things like circumcision, Sabbath, the purity laws, and the food laws. And in their eyes, eating with Gentiles was a huge issue. It was a sin on all sorts of levels. Again, eating with Gentiles said you accepted them as family, even though they didn't keep the law. Eating with Gentiles said you disagreed with God on keeping kosher. And eating with Gentiles said you had no morals whatsoever. You were eating with Gentiles for goodness sake. No good Christian would be caught dead doing such things. Which in the eyes of these critics meant that the church in Antioch was not comprised of any good Christians. And so these critics felt called, God bless them, to fix the situation. And they began by outlawing eating together. Then they mandated strict obedience to the law and keeping everybody segregated. Then they began applying pressure on everyone so that no one would ever break any of these rules ever again. Here's what I think. These critics weren't curious. They were just judgmental. Now, maybe they had some good reason for being critical here. After all, Leviticus 11 clearly stipulates that God's people should not eat unclean food. And the rest of the law stipulates God's people should not eat with unclean people. But it is also possible that these critics were thinking of back home in Jerusalem. See, the unbelieving Jews in Jerusalem were very suspicious of the church. They weren't sure what was going on in it, but they didn't like it. Now, if these very observant Jews heard that believing Jews and Gentiles in these churches were intermingling together, that would be bad. Worse, if they heard that the church was turning Jews away from the law, that would be terrible. Even worse yet, though, if they heard that the Jews and Gentiles in the church were eating together and were removing the barriers God had put in place to keep them separate, well, that would be catastrophic. And if all that was going on in these churches all over the world, the Jews in Jerusalem would have to do something about it. But they couldn't punish Antioch. Antioch was in Turkey, 300 plus miles away. But they could punish the church in their own backyard. They could punish the church in Jerusalem. 
and the church there was already suffering. Adding persecution to their struggles would be too much for them to bear. And so to keep that from happening and to serve the church in Jerusalem, these critics begged the believers in Antioch to stop eating together, to show respect for the food laws, and to maintain a holy distance from each other. Now, that may involve a little conjecture, but it makes sense as to why Peter and Barnabas both would side with these critics. But even if my proposal is wrong, the fact is, for some reason, Peter and Barnabas stopped eating with the Gentiles. And the us versus them church was born. We, those who really love God, go here. And they, those second class citizen, citizens, well, they go there. <laughs> this squabble seems so juvenile to us. Such a big deal over such a little issue, eating together. How could they not have resolved it with a simple conversation? Thankfully, we don't have such issues today. There's nothing on the table that could cause open hostility or division in the evangelical church or come close to causing people to leave our churches today. Unless maybe it was politics. Because we may disagree rather heatedly on politics. Uh, or, or maybe, I guess, perhaps, I don't know, the whole issue of ordaining women might cause a bit of an uproar in some places. And it might be that discussions about abortion or euthanasia or the death penalty, well, they might cause a dispute one or two somewhere. And I bet we could also raise our corporate blood pressure to the stroke level if we raise the LGBTQ plus question. And what is our stance on immigration? And what does it mean to stand with the poor and the oppressed? And what does it mean to stand against abuses of power? And maybe there's a few other issues out there that might create a bit of a ruckus. Issues like racial reconciliation, white privilege, January 6th, and gun control. Maybe these conversations would push us to the breaking point. Maybe. Yeah. In fact, all these things could rip the evangelical church apart at the seams. And I didn't even mention, not once, how we differ on politics or gun control. Now, just mentioning these topics is enough to send a few people into cardiac arrest. I get that. No one wants to talk about these things with people with whom they disagree. I certainly don't. I've tried. It was no fun, and it accomplished nothing. Well, that's not exactly true. It accomplished three things. It told us not to trust those people. It told us that we shouldn't like those people. And it told us that those people are the problem. Now, if you understand all these emotions that are going on behind these topics, then you understand the situation in Antioch really well. They didn't trust each other. They didn't like each other. And they thought the other person was the problem. And all that vileness and anger threatened to divide the church. Now, just to be clear, if you ask those who disagreed with me politically or theologically or any of these other ways, they would tell you that they don't trust me. They don't like me, and they don't understand me. And in many ways, they would say that I am the problem. And in many ways, they're probably right. After all, I don't understand me. Bottom line, 2,000 years have passed. And the church is still divided. And we all know why. We don't trust or like each other. And overcoming those barriers is just too difficult. Here's our problem summed up in one more Ted Lasso quote. He said, I'm going to say, man, sometimes you remind me of my grandma with the remote control. 
You just push all the wrong buttons. That's us. We look at each other and then we push all the wrong buttons. And as a result, the evangelical church, our church, are fracturing and are divided. It's Antioch all over again with one major difference. The church in Antioch had Paul that could lead them and find the way home. Paul returns to Antioch and he sees his church divided and defeated and he goes ballistic. We don't often see anger like this in Paul, but it's here. He sees Peter eating over there with the Jews and the Gentiles eating over there by themselves and he quickly grasps what has taken place. And he immediately goes over to Peter and he gets in his face. And in front of everyone, he calls Peter a hypocrite. Yikes. He tells him unequivocally that he is not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. Now that's a pretty harsh thing to say to the leader of the church. But Paul is not done. He goes off on Peter saying, and I'm paraphrasing here, since you arrived here in Antioch, you have been acting like a Christ follower, free to love your brothers and sisters, and you have shown that oneness we have in Christ by eating with the Gentiles. But now you have abandoned your freedom and have left Christ and have gone back to the law. Worse, you want to coerce the Gentiles to Judaize. To Judaize? Well, granted, that sounds really awkward, but that is a literal translation of what Paul is saying. So what does it mean to Judaize someone? Well, let me quote from Scott McKnight here. There were times when Jews physically forced Gentiles in their country, in Israel, to get circumcised if they wanted to live in their midst. You want to live here? This is what we're going to do to you. That's what Peter was doing metaphorically to these Gentiles. He was cutting them off at the pass to grace and forcing them to bear the weight of the law with all of its boundary markers. In short, he was forcing the Gentiles to leave Jesus and to cling to Moses. But Paul is far from being done. He continues his barrage of Peter. A day ago, you were living as a new creation in Christ, but now you have turned away from Christ and returned to the law. A day ago, you were a follower of Christ, but today you are a Jew. And it would be one thing if you were the only one doing this, but you have compelled others to follow you in your hypocrisy. Granted, if you said these words to any Christ follower, it would sting. But to tell Peter he had denied Christ and gone back to being an ordinary Jew again had to open up deep, deep, deep wounds. Now, you really can't blame Paul for being so hot. If he lets Peter's hypocrisy go, it would mean the end of Jews and Gentiles in one body. Now, that doesn't sound like that big of a deal. After all, birds of a feather worship best together. That's why we have serious Presbyterians in here and those crazy Baptists over there and those wild Pentecostals way over there. And while we can go to concerts together, please don't put us in the same worship service because we don't want to be together because those other people, they're wacky. And for heaven's sake, don't try to force different economic classes or different ethnicities or different cultures or different food smells. Don't try to force different together in one church. We're just too different. We're just too hard and it's just too uncomfortable to be together. Jews and Gentiles in one body, it's a beautiful idea but it's just too much work. Yes, there is one God and Father of all, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one spirit, but there needs to be two, maybe three, maybe four, 
at the most 10,000 bodies because we are just too different. Can I get an amen? You bet I can because we all feel the same way. It's too much work worshiping, being with people who are really different. When we were in China, we often went out to dinner with school dignitaries. They were always very nice to us and we were always so well treated. And at these meals, there would always be a lot of toasts. A lot because everyone wanted to say something and everyone wanted to drink. And after the toast, everyone would clink glasses together and then someone would fill your glass so that we could do it again and again and again as long as the night was long. And after several years of doing this, someone told me a secret. In a toast, you always wanted to have your glass lower than the other person's because it symbolized that you were giving them honor. If your glass was above theirs, you were saying that you were superior and that you were deserving of honor. Now, when I learned that, I freaked out because I had been to numerous dinners and I just tapped glasses. I didn't think about where my glass was. Who would? I wasn't trying to make a statement. I was just trying to have a glass of wine. But now I realize that I probably had insulted 90% of our hosts with my high toast. Worse, after learning that, I had to watch everything I did so I didn't unintentionally insult anyone and cause an international incident. And it was so hard trying to get the cup to the lowest level. Another Chinese honor that turned into a horror. We were by the coast, so they often served fish while we were there. Now the Chinese prepare fish with the head still attached. And when the waiters bring the fish to the table, they always aim the head of the fish to the head of the table towards the guest of honor, which was usually me. And at some point during the meal, the guest of honor would then get to pluck out the fish eyes and eat them. Now, the fish was really delicious, but I'm really not into eating eyes. I think it's the squishing, the popping, and thinking that the last thing that poor fish is going to see is my teeth chomping down upon them. But it was an honor to get the eyes and it was an insult to reject the eyes. Bottom line, eating together is just so hard. Being together is just so hard. Being one in the body is so hard. We're called to be one in the bond of love, and that means for Jesus' sake we have to figure it out, but it's so hard. Now, when you read Paul, you understand why this is so important. Paul grew up in a symbol-rich culture. Everything you did said something about who you were. And that means what you ate, who you ate with, what you did, and when you did it were all loaded with significance. See, the boundary markers were designed to set you apart from others who did not have the same level of devotion as you did. And by keeping these markers, you told the world who you were. And Paul was a Pharisee, so these things were even more important to him. In fact, for years before his encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road, these boundary markers would have been at the core of Paul's philosophy of life. These are my values. This is how I will live. But then Peter, uh, then Jesus intercepted Paul on the Damascus Road. And all those symbols that were so important to him, almost overnight, became irrelevant. But it wasn't that Paul went from a symbol-rich philosophy to a symbol-free philosophy. Hardly. It was that his symbols changed. Keeping the law was no longer a symbol that mattered. Loving your neighbor did. Circumcision no longer mattered, but baptism did. 
Passover no longer mattered, but the Lord's Supper did. And being a Jew, a member of God's covenant people, God's chosen people, no longer mattered because another symbol had taken its place. And what was that new symbol? N.T. Wright explains. What then were the symbols of Paul's own philosophy? They are the symbols which speak of Jesus Christ. They include the acted symbol of baptism and the Lord's Supper. But I have come to the conclusion that the central symbol of Paul's philosophy of life is the united community. Jew, Greek, slave free, male, female, the one family of Abraham, the family for the world, the single family created anew in Jesus Christ from people of every kind. Don't miss that. The symbol that Christ had come and established his kingdom on earth. The symbol that the promise to Abraham to bless the whole world had come. The symbol that the gospel was no longer just for Israel, but for everyone. And not just for those who have status, but for Gentiles and women and for slaves and for the marginalized had come. And that symbol was the church a community of people who differed in every way imaginable, but who were one in the bond of love in Christ Jesus. See, at the core of Paul's philosophy of life is that we are called to be one in Christ, that we are called to live together in loving community where we celebrate our differences, carry each other's burdens, and give ourselves over to oneness for his name's sake. Community is not optional. It is not something we can just let go of when it gets too difficult. No, community is our calling. It's worth fighting for. It's worth dying for. And that is why Paul says all that he says in verses 19 through 20. For through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul says, here's my philosophy of life. I don't care how hard it is, I'm going to live for God. And while I would rather live the easy life, who wouldn't? My old self has been crucified with Christ, so I am no longer controlled by what I want to do or what makes me feel the happiest. My old self has died. It has been crucified with Christ. It no longer controls me, but Christ lives in me. And as long as I do what he wants to do through me, then I will be fulfilled. And this is not a new law. I've died to the law. All that I do, I do because I am a recipient of God's unrelenting grace. And my desire is to show my gratitude for God's faithfulness, for God's love, and for God's gift of salvation through my actions, through my worship, and through living a life of love. And if living in unity with people who are very different from me shows my gratitude to God, then I am all in. Again, for Paul, community was at the heart of the gospel. We are called to be one. But it is not just what Paul wants to feel good about himself in his relationship with God. Paul wants his life to count. And that also is at the core of his philosophy. And Paul believes that by living in community with people who are vastly different from us, we will proclaim to the world that Jesus is Lord. I know I just quoted N.T. Wright, but he says it the best. The unity of the church, the new way of humble unity lived out by the followers of Jesus is to be the sign to the world that there is a different way of being human. It is the fact of a new, single, united family that tells the world that Israel's God is God and that Jesus is Lord and Caesar is not. How important is community? Think about it. 
the most important church-defining moment in the early church didn't revolve around huge theological debates dealing with Christology or predestination or the coming of the kingdom. It revolved around one question. Can Jews and Gentile Christ followers eat together at the same table? Is the church one body or two? And the heart of that issue is still with us today. Can we embrace our brothers and sisters who are profoundly different from us? Can we be one in the bond of love? Here's Paul's philosophy of life. Community matters. Loving your neighbor matters. Putting aside your differences matters. Responding to God's grace by being gracious to others matters. Responding to God's grace by always being faithful to your call matters. Dying to self and your ambitions and living for Christ matters. Basking in God's gracious gift of love and salvation as a dearly loved son or daughter matters. And boldly proclaiming that we are one in the bond of love in everything we do matters. And that is great news. But it is more than that. It is our calling. But it comes with all sorts of perks. I'll leave you with just one perk to think about. And it should be no surprise to anyone here that it comes from the theologian Ted Lasso. He said, I think that if you care about someone and you got a little love in your heart, there ain't nothing you can't get through together. That's a huge perk, but that's community. That's love. And that's a philosophy of life well worth embracing. More on Paul's philosophy of life next week. Let's pray. Father God, there are topic after topic, issue upon issue, that we could talk about and have divide us. Even if you are in the middle of all these issues, you'll be divided from people on both sides. There's no way out of it. We all have strong feelings about all sorts of things. And those issues become so big for us that we can't see that which unites us in Christ Jesus. What Christ says, what Christ has done, what Christ is doing, what Christ has called us to do seems of little importance compared to these other issues. And that's just misguided. Teach us how we can talk to one another. Teach us how we can show grace. Teach us what principles are necessary to hold on to. And others that we can let go of, even though we hold them strong. Help us to see the other person with Jesus' eyes. Help us to understand before trying to be understood. Give us grace so that we could truly be your people, called to be one in the bond of love. This is extra hard. We don't want to do it. The very thought makes many of us angry. Forgive us our short-sightedness. Forgive us our selfish ambition. Forgive us our lack of love. And teach us how to live out you as our philosophy of life, that we would truly love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our response is to stand together and sing. Let's do it together.
the blessing of God. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Have a great, great week and a wonderful June. God bless you all. Amen.